welcome to the Emerald City Sportscast. Wilson, it is he throws deep down field. It's going to be caught by Metcalf for the touchdown. Hosted by longtime Northwest sports journalist Dan Viennes. Here's the drive deep to left. He has done it again. Wow. Kyle Lewis, three games, three home runs. Mariners have a five two. Lead. Brought to you by Hollywood and Vines Recording Studio. World class audio recording right in the heart of the Woodenville Winery District. Wide receivers to either side. Russell takes the snap, drops back. He's going to throw down the middle. He's got a man. The ball is caught. Game over, it baby. Is a touchdown. The game is over. The Seahawks are going back to the Super Bowl. In- and now, broadcasting live from the Dan Cave Studios, here's your host, Dan Vien. All right, everybody, welcome back to the Emerald City Sportscast. It's a beautiful, sunny day here in the Pacific Northwest. And uh, a lot of Seahawks talk to get to today. Uh, I gotta, I have to chuckle. Uh, just a little bit of a behind the scenes thing here. Uh, I usually get set up for the show about a half an hour in advance. Just want to make sure all the tech is working, connections good, everything is uh, is on track. I kind of do a little run through of the first segment just to make sure that all my muscle memory is uh, is all set to push the right buttons. Um, but sometimes I get a little distracted. In fact, I've learned I have to set an alarm. And today what set me off is I was, I was looking at Twitter and, um, and I saw that Kyle Brandt had sent out, uh, he has that great podcast, uh, 10 questions where he interviews, uh, star athletes, but not just star athletes, other, other celebrities who have an interest in sports. And he had, uh, he had, uh, Key from Key and Peele on today, Keegan. And they were talking about the, the great sketches that, that those guys have done with the uh, the college all star games and all the funny names. So then I went down that rabbit hole and I was watching YouTube videos. And before I knew it, uh, it was like two minutes to air and it was time to go. So that's uh, that's how hard I work behind the scenes here at the Emerald City Sportscast. But listen, we have a lot to get to today. Uh, Rob Staten is uh, standing by from the Seahawks draft blog. Uh, so let's get into today's headlines. Ladies and gentlemen, can I please have your attention? I've just been handed an urgent and horrifying news story. And I need all of you to stop what you're doing and listen. And now here's today's headlines brought to you by FreeBets, the newest online sports betting comparison site. Check them out at freebets.us. All right, thanks again as always to the guys at freebets.us for sponsoring this segment. Headlines this week. Fresh new Major League Baseball farm system rankings are coming out this morning. Um, Just in the last couple hours, two of the biggest were released, both looking kindly upon the Seattle Mariners system, albeit to much different degrees. Keith Law of The Athletic and ESPN has nothing but praise for the Mariners' player development efforts, yet he places their system at 13th on his list. That is the lowest we've seen anyone rank them in the last couple of years. But Baseball America slots the Mariners in at number two on their just-released list which is remarkable when you consider the M's graduated three top 100 players from prospect status last year in Kyle Lewis, Evan White, and Justice Sheffield. Both services have the Tampa Bay Rays at number one. Trouble in Pullman for the Washington State Cougars freshman starting quarterback. Jaden Delora was cited for DUI over the weekend and suspended indefinitely by the team. In four starts in 2020, Delora threw for almost 900 yards while accounting for seven total touchdowns. He was facing an uphill battle to retain his starting spot this fall with the arrival of graduate transfer Jarrett Guarantano. Got to get that name right. He's going to be the guy uh, transferring from Tennessee. This news not likely to help Dolores' case. And Russell Wilson dominated yesterday's sports news cycle just two days after winning the NFL's prestigious Walter Payton Man of the Year Award. Wilson expressed his dissatisfaction with the Seahawks' efforts to provide adequate pass protection for him First, in a report from Jason Lockenfora, then in an appearance on the Dan Patrick Show, he doubled down, and later in a conference call with local reporters. I'll have my thoughts on that and get Rob Staten's take on it as well as how it may impact, if at all, Wilson's near and long-term future with the Seahawks. But first, let's get to a break uh, before Rob gets in here of the Seahawks draft blog, before he joins me to discuss his proposed offseason plan for the team. It is bold. It is sure to be controversial with some of you which means you're not going to want to miss it. 
Uh, so let's get into a break. Rob Staten on the other side of this break. You're listening to the Emerald City Sportscast on the new 365 Sportscast Network. Looking for a place of inspiration to record your next musical or vocal project? Why not do it in the middle of wine country? Hollywood and Vines Recording Studio is a four-room boutique recording studio in the heart of Woodenville Tourist District on Hollywood Hill. Within walking distance of over a hundred different wine, beer, and spirit tasting rooms, this peaceful setting offers a respite from the rat race of everything around it. The studio features 14-foot ceilings throughout and a large main tracking room, along with separate isolation rooms for drum tracking and vocals. Featuring a talented crew of freelance engineers and an impressive array of industry-leading equipment, my friends at Hollywood and Vine Studios can assist with your audio tracking, mixing, and mastering pursuits. To find out more or to book a session, email kevin at hollywood-vines.com, call 206-235-8125, or visit hollywood-vines.com. If you're like me, you love animals. I mean, you love animals. And if you're looking to add a new furry friend to your family, the best way to show your love is by supporting No-Kill Animal Adoption Centers. And the best way to do that is by checking out nokillnetwork.org. The volunteers at No-Kill Network seek not only to support No-Kill Adoption Centers, but help make a change by working with all animal shelters to change their policies and make sure every pet has the chance to find their human. And with the COVID pandemic, many of these shelters are full and these pets need you. So check out nokillnetwork.org for a list of no-kill shelters near you. And there's even a handy adoption pet finder tool you can use to help you find your next best friend. That's nokillnetwork.org. Online gamers, have you checked out PSX Extreme? If not, you're missing out. PSX Extreme is a cutting-edge gaming website providing you with everything you need to know about the latest and greatest games. You'll find up-to-the-minute news about the gaming industry as well as in-depth reviews of all the coolest games. The writing staff at PSX Extreme will also keep you informed on all the rumors about new games in development and impending releases. So if you can put down the controller just for a second, do yourself a favor and check out PSXExtreme.com. You're listening to the Emerald City Sportscast, presented by Hollywood and Vine's recording studio. And now, here's Dan. All right, it is, it is my uh, sincere pleasure to welcome my next guest to the Emerald City Sportscast, Mr. Rob Staten, joining me of the Seahawks Draft Blog. And I also wanted to get this in there. Um, for those of you who aren't familiar with Rob's work, um, I've been reading the Draft Blogs probably since it launched in 2008, and I've always appreciated your ability to uh, really tap into to how the brain trust in Seattle works, how John Schneider, Pete Carroll... Uh, how they go about identifying prospects, um, going after prospects. Uh, and you've always been really good at being ahead of the game before each draft and identifying players that fit what they're looking for. And uh, not just the Seahawks, but I wanted to give you uh, some kudos for your placement in the, on the huddle report. Every year they grade mock drafts. You finished third this last year. Your five-year rolling average is 15th. And we're talking about uh, names like uh, Lance Zerloin, Zerloin and uh, Peter Schrager and guys like that. You blow them all away. It's a pleasure to have you on the show, sir. No, thanks, Dan. That's a really nice uh, introduction. It's a pleasure to be here. <laughs> um, we're going to get to the Russell Wilson stuff in a minute because I think when you, when, you, when you talk about context and where the Seahawks are right now, I think this other stuff that you brought up in your offseason plan has to come first, either way, no matter what they're going to do. Um, but first, I want to ask you this. You watched the Super Bowl Sunday. Um, yeah, I'm not going to get into my thoughts on the game. I thought it was a snooze fest. And some of that was Tampa Bay Buccaneers' fault. They kind of made it that way. But Tampa Bay clearly now class of the league. I thought, once again, the Super Bowl helped us identify the team that truly was playing better than anybody at the end of the year and was put together uh, the best roster top to bottom at the end of the year, playing at a high level. If you were to... to to take a, an evaluation of where Tampa Bay finished at the end of the year, comparing their roster to Seattle's roster at the end of the year, not going into this offseason, not worrying about free agents. 
Seattle finished 12 and four, gets bounced in the first round. How wide is that gap? How far are the Seahawks away from from where Tampa Bay finished up? I think they're a mile away, personally, Dan. I mean, I think that the Tampa Bay Buccaneers had pretty much a complete roster at the end of the season. I mean, you look at where were the weaknesses? They had a really strong performing offensive line. They had, obviously, the, the best quarterback that's ever played the game. They got weapons all over the field at receiver and tight end. They got two running backs who were, who were running the ball really very well. And then you look on the defensive side, and they've got a terrific front four. You know, they just have that ability to rush with four, which is so crucial in the NFL. And when they need to blitz, they've got one of the most creative blitzing defensive coordinators in the NFL. You look at the linebackers, they're terrific. And if you're going to say there's any sort of part of the team that is maybe not truly top-notch and elite, it's probably the secondary. But it's not that they have bad players there. It's not that they haven't invested picks in, in that range. They have done. And, you know, you, you can't be brilliant everywhere. And I think the fact that the front yeah. four is so good and the linebacker and the front seven is so good, it takes away some of that pressure from the defensive backs. And on the other hand, the Seahawks have, you know, no one's saying, I'm not saying the Seahawks are a bad team, but they, they're just not strong across the board. They have holes. They have areas where they need to improve. And for me, they're, they're quite some way off the Tampa Bay Buccaneers. As a Seahawk fan, it was fascinating to watch the game, um, not just because Russell Wilson was sitting next to Roger Goodell up in his up in his box, um, but when it, when I when I looked at Kansas City and how they were struggling and and obviously missing their two starting tackles and in Fisher and Schwartz was tough. Uh, seeing Pat Mahomes not having time to set his feet, having to run for his life, really taking them out of any game plan that they might have had going into the game to try and to try and mitigate that reminds us as Seahawks fans of when the Seahawks offense struggles and particularly some of those issues up front and and with Russell not getting the ball out quick. Conversely, though, that Tampa Bay offense and the way that they operated, is that is that kind of a blueprint for what Pete Carroll wants the Seahawks offense to be? Yes, I think so. I think that he wants to be able to move the ball around, you know, on offense. And I think they want to be able to run the ball. Now, it, it doesn't mean that I think people confuse Pete's desire to run the ball with uh, confusing that with wanting to run on, you know, early in games and often in games and stuff like that. It's not yeah. necessarily that that's the case. I mean, there have been many games and people often forget this, Dan, during the Marshawn Lynch era where the Silks would come out throwing and everybody would be complaining on Twitter that they haven't just given it to yeah. Marshawn in the first yeah, two absolutely. Quarters. And then you come out after half time and establish Marshawn Lynch. So it's not that they just want to run and run and do it early and often. I, I think that they want to have explosive plays. You know, it's it's another thing that's often forgotten is how much Pete loves to throw the ball downfield. And that used to be the most exciting thing about the NFL was the downfield pass. And any team that was doing that, you know, that would often be the offense that you craved from your team. A great quarterback who could throw it downfield, receivers who could, could beat uh, cornerbacks and get downfield and make those big plays. And I think Pete craves that just as much as he does a really tough physical running game. Pete wants balance. He wants to connect the defense and the offense. And Tampa Bay have done that. You know, it, it was the perfect storm for Tampa Bay, wasn't it? They got ahead. They then ran the ball to win. Their defense was restrictive. I mean, to limit Patrick Mahomes and the Chiefs and Andy Reid and Eric Bieniemy to just nine points in the game yeah. was truly sensational. That is what Pete wants his teams to be. But sadly, they have not consistently been a team like that for many, many years now. So let's talk about your offseason plan. As the Seahawks go into this offseason, we know this, this has been beaten to death. They only have four draft picks. Uh, no first rounder, obviously, in the Jamal Adams trade um, this year or next year. And also, let's just say no cap space. Depending on where you look, there's two million or less than a million in effective cap space. So not a lot to work with. A bunch of impending free agents. Um, fans may want to think it's a team that's one or two tweaks away. That maybe they they get lightning in a bottle, sign the right free agent, they get the right second round draft pick, they're off and running. You see this offseason, what you would do if you were the general manager of the Seahawks, not what you think they would do, but you frame this offseason plan as what you would do. You see it very differently, don't you? Yeah, I mean, if there are any fans that think they're just a couple of pieces away, then I would say, well, how are you going to replace your cornerback, your two top tight ends, your center, your number two pass rusher, and all of the other guys that are free agents this offseason when you have $2 million of cap space, effective cap space, available to spend according to over the cap. You just simply don't have the resources to fill all of those holes. At the moment, they can't even keep Poon Ford on a second round tender because mm, his yeah. tender will be 
$3 million, just over $3 million, and they only have $2 million of cap space. So unless you want to lose Puna Ford on top of all the, you know, the Shaquille Griffins, Chris Carson, you've got two tight ends out of the, Ethan Posick, Mike Yapati, you've got so many starting positions that you need to fill. It's just not conceivable that you're going to get all this done with a couple of restructures and four draft picks. You're going to have to do something more bold than that. And the sort of my feeling on it is, is that I, I think it's it's fair. I mean, I'm going to be really honest with this, Dan. It's it's kind of nonsensical the way that the Seahawks have spent their resources over the years. So to be yeah. paying two linebackers $25 million last year in Wagner and, and Wright, and then to go and spend a first round pick on Jordan Brooks, having spent picks to trade up in round three the year before for Cody Barton, you just cannot justify that level of investment at linebacker unless you plan to move on from people like Bobby Wagner and KJ Wright and save money. The Brooks pick doesn't work as a money saver, as a forward thinking plan, unless you're going to move on from those guys. It just otherwise draft a center. So that's one less hole you've got to fill this year. Draft a running back. So that's one less hole you've got to fill or a cornerback. And they just haven't done that. They drafted a linebacker. So they've made the bed as far as I'm concerned. They really need to start Jordan Brooks and they have to not be paying two other players $25 million at the linebacker position this year. Meanwhile, at safety, you, you spend a second round pick on Marquis Blair. You trade a fifth round pick for Quandra Dix, inherit his contract. Then you spend two more first round picks and a third round pick on Jamal Adams. And if you want to keep Jamal Adams, you've got to pay him, let's be realistic, 18 to $20 million yep. a year moving forward, unless he decides that he is. And, and there's no reason why he would off ask for less than that. Right. And the absolute minimum is 16 million with him because that will usurp Buddha Baker. But it's more likely to be 18 to 20. You just cannot justify spending that level of resource on two positions that most teams in the league will say, we can find linebackers and safeties. What we need to invest in is the trenches and at quarterback and at receiver and at cornerback, because that's generally where games are won. Silks have invested in a quarterback. The main issue that Russell Wilson has right now is he doesn't feel that they've invested enough in that line or both lines and at receiver and then perhaps on the other side of the ball, a cornerback to take away players in the way that we've seen Jalen Ramsey take away DK Metcalf at times. So I just think that their whole vision and plan and their resource is being spent in the wrong place. And for me, this offseason, they've got to transfer some of that resource from linebacker and safety, get it into the trenches. It seems like this has been an issue for a while. And, and give me your thoughts on this. What my feeling is, is rather than have an organizational philosophy on how to distribute the payroll and where to where to prioritize salary at which position groups, they fall in love with players, then they figure out a way to get that player at whatever cost and then justify it by fitting them in however they can. Is that fair? Yeah, I think there's, there's an element of that. And um, I think that they've, they've maybe been, they've not been willing to take the, the difficult decision over the years. You know, I don't think that Bill Belichick necessarily would have said, we're going to pay Bobby Wagner $18 million a year a few years ago. Yeah. And I certainly don't think Bill Belichick would be looking at this situation now saying, right, we've got $2 million to spend in a whole bunch of holes. Um, I'll pay Bobby Wagner $17 million this year and $20 million next year, which is what his cap hits are. I think he's moving on, and he gets what he can. And look, Bill Belichick has traded players, which would seem as a classic example, for two first-round picks that he had no business getting that, that return for that player at that age. However, he also trades players away for, for, for less than you would probably, he probably should have done like Chandler Jones um, and, and Calvin Noy and people like that. But yeah. you've, you've got to be willing to make a few difficult decisions in order to refresh and make sure that you're, you're investing in the right areas. And you know what, a great player, Bobby Wagner in 20, 2018 when he, when he was brilliant and then warranted an extension, is he still playing at that level? Debatable, whether he's worth the money that perhaps his performance in 2018 would have warranted and uh, they've got to make difficult decisions it's it's not unless you just want to meander through i mean like it's yeah. every single year it kind of finishes the same you've got to sort of say look what do we want to be when they were at their best in fairness dan and I, you know no they can't recreate the lob that's not going to happen what they can do is recreate the amount of resource they spent on their offensive line the most expensive o-line in the league in 2013 yeah. and have a really great running game and you know what? If you could get another weapon for Russell Wilson for the $35 million quarterback and keep him happy, then you're moving in the right direction for me. And I'd rather go that route than having expensive linebackers and safeties, frankly. All right. So so you've set the stage, and now you've mentioned Bobby Wagner a number of times. Let's get to your first bold move that you would make. You're talking about trading him, aren't you? 
Yes, I think you should seriously consider that. Unless he's willing to tear up his contract and, and redo everything at a much more reasonable price, then yes, I would consider trading Bobby Wagner. As he, doesn't, he doesn't strike me as that type of player. No, I don't think he is either. Um, but you've drafted Jordan Brooks. I mean, it really yeah. is as simple as this. If you were intending on having Bobby Wagner for the next few years, you don't spend a first-round pick on a linebacker. Yeah. You know, it's just that doesn't make any sense to me to be paying, you know, $17 million and then $20 million for Bobby Wagner for the next two years and have a first round pick at linebacker while you've got so many holes. You haven't got a starting center for next year. You haven't got a starting guard. You haven't got a starting cornerback right now. I mean, it just doesn't make sense to have all that resource into one position. And, and frankly, I do think that they are seriously consider considering what to do with Bobby Wagner. And it's an uncomfortable conversation because Seals sure. fans don't want to have this chat. We don't want to think about life without Bobby Wagner, but we should do because it, it's going to happen in the next two years, even if it doesn't happen now. So if you can get something for him now, I don't know what you could get for him. I'm not saying that you're going to get a huge haul for Bobby Wagner, but I think you have to consider that for the salary saving and getting back into this draft, then it's worth it. And I think there are teams that would be very interested in Bobby. Look, there are teams that are rebuilding, that have got the running Seattle schemes. You just look at new, the New York Jets, for example, with Robert Sala. You know, they have nobody on their defense right now that they can hang the hat on and say, he's a leader. He's going to guide us through this rebuild now. Um, and they don't have a culture. And they are looking to rebuild a culture. I can't think of a better player to come in and be the captain of the team right now than someone like Bobby Wander. He would possibly be quite valuable to them. They've got huge cap space. They can justify his contract mm -hmm. for a couple of years as well. So I think they would be. He would be probably quite valuable to a team like the Jets. Not so much so to a team with lesser cap space, who are maybe a more established roster, just trying to add a really good player. So I think you've got to see what's out there for Bobby, and you've got to trust Jordan Brooks. You drafted him. He's a middle linebacker. You've got to trust him next year and say, "You're our starter," and uh, we're going to move on and get back in this draft. Yeah, it's interesting you bring up the Patriots because I think one thing that Belichick's been known for over the years is it's not so much, you know, fans would go crazy. There's no two ways about it. If you traded Bobby Wagner today, uh, they would point out the fact that he just finished first team all pro again. Um, but trading a guy before his decline is something that Bill Belichick has done really well in his career. It's come back to bite him a couple of times. Chandler Jones, you brought up. Um, so Bobby Wagner's one. The next one, the next kind of elephant in the room, what do you do about Jamal Adams? I don't think you trade him. I've got no issues. Uh, with, I mean, I, I, Jamal Adams is a good player. I'm not saying for a second that he's a bad player. and not saying that for Bobby Wagner either. But what is Jamal Adams? Let's, let's be right here. I think he's a poor scheme fit, first of all. And I think you see that in his PFF grades. Coverage grade is poor. His overall grade was the 52nd best safety in, in the NFL. I don't think that Jamal Adams is the 52nd best safety in the NFL. But I think in Seattle's scheme, he may well be. And I don't think it's just the injuries and the newness of everything. I don't think that he is a, is a great fit. I think that the Seahawks have had to, to try and manipulate their defense and manufacture a justification for having him in the team. So they blitzed 36% of the time this year, two years ago when they didn't have Jamal Adams and they had Frank Clark, for example. They blitzed 18%. That's half as much yeah. as they were now. Yet their, pass, uh, their uh, sack percentage was higher in 2018 than it was in 2020. That's despite all of the increased blitzing. What are you doing when you blitz Jamal Adams? Quite often you're kind of telegraphing it. You're moving him up to the line of scrimmage and he's having, you know, he's saying, try and get to the quarterback, Jamal. You know, there's no, he's not beating a, a left tackle. He's not really doing anything much other than just chasing after the quarterback. And if a team knows that you're going to do that quite often and they can ID when he's going to come to the line or if they even see it before the snap and look, I don't know about you, but I could see quite often in games, Jamal's going to blitz here because he's yeah. come up to the line of scrimmage. Then a quarterback can probably see that. And he's got an advantage there because he knows there's going to be a hole in the secondary because Jamal's doing that. So I think the sacks is a bit of a mirage in terms of, I think if you ask Ryan Neal to blitz eight times a game, there is a chance that he could get 0 0.8 sacks a game, which is what Jamal yeah. Adams had. Or you could ask Marquise Blair or Keanu Neal or you know Malik Hooker, who's a, a free agent, to do that job. So I don't think I wouldn't pay any safety 18 to 20 million dollars a year. I think that he's your best chance to get some some decent stock. If Bobby's only a third rounder or maybe a second rounder a push for the right team. Jamal's somebody who for me has retained some value. You could potentially get a first round pick for him. Sure. You could go and invest that in an offensive lineman or a receiver. Those are the two really strong positions in this draft class, I think. And you can you can move forward. And I think that's a difficult choice that they simply have to make. It's interesting because when he was acquired, uh, I think 
everybody assumed and 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 many had reported that you know they knew what they were getting when they made that deal they knew the extension he was going to demand um and they knew that they would have to do that to be able to justify the the draft capital they gave up to get him um but now I'm seeing Brady Henderson, who does a fine job covering the team and, and seems to really have his finger on the pulse there, says that they have considered uh, or when they when they acquired him, they did consider the the idea that they could recoup some of what they gave up if they had to trade him after the first year. If you had to bet on one of those or the other, Wagner or Adams, who would you say is the most likely to be moved? That's a great question. I, it's, it's hard to predict. I don't... I, I I agree with Brady Henderson in, in in that you know when they made that trade I think I think it was a bit of a desperation move frankly and I think you have to kind of put yeah. yourself back where the Seahawks were when they it definitely made had that. a feel kind of like the clowny move of they thought they needed one piece to put him over the top. Well, they started the offseason saying our priority was the pass rush and they knew yeah. that they had to improve on defense. Yeah. And by let's be right here by the time they made that Jamal Adams trade. What had they actually done for the defense? Not they a heck of a lot. Bruce Irvin, mm-hmm. they brought in Benson, Benson Mayo, and they'd subtracted Clowney. That was it. Their big addition was Quinton Dunbar. And at the time of the Jamal Adams trade, we didn't know whether he was going to jail or not. That right. had not been resolved at that point. So they'd actually brought no impact players. Unless you want to say that subtracting Clowney for Benson Mayo is an upgrade. I mean, some people do argue that, but... I think people forget what Jadavian Clowney actually did in the games that he played for the Seahawks, in particular that Philadelphia playoff game and the Niners game and what a game that was yeah. in uh, Santa Clara when they won there. But that wasn't an, an upgrade for me. And to go into the season having practically done nothing to improve your defense just wasn't, I don't think it was cutting it. And I think Pete and John said, we've got to get somebody. And it, and it was a perfect storm in the regard that Jamal Adams was available. But I think the fact that they ended up spending what they did also suggests a level of desperation. We have to have this guy. Yeah. He's an all pro. He's going to come in and he could upgrade our team and he can help us in different ways. And I think they made that trade to try and find a really quality impact player that they hadn't had up until that point that they hadn't been able to bring in during the offseason in order to give them a chance to do something in 2020. I don't think they made that trade saying, oh, we've been trying to get Jamal Adams for six months. We've finally done it. And now we're going to invest and he's going to be the future of the defense of four or five years. I don't think that's what it was at all. I think it was a move for 2020. And then we will see where we are in the off season. Can yeah. we get a deal done? Yeah, but we're going to set a limit on what, what we're willing to pay. And if Jamal Adams asks for more, then he's going to be gone. So it's whether or not, you know, the Seahawks will be here and Adams is going to be here. And it's whether they can kind of meet in the middle somewhere to, to get a deal done. If they can't, he's gone. Yeah. It'll be as simple as that. Well, and when they made the move for Adams, they also hadn't acquired Carlos Dunlap yet. And and we saw the impact he had on the team, and he's somebody that I'm sure they want to uh, restructure or, or give an extension to. But he's, he's what, a $16, $17 million cap hit this year? So you add that onto the pile, and that makes it tougher. Now, you've cleared a bunch of cap space. You've traded Bobby Wagner and Jamal Adams. You're getting uh, you're getting hate mail, and people are picketing outside your office at, at VMAC. What's the first thing you do with that money in free agency? The first thing I do is I pick up the phone to Brandon Scherf and say, how much is it going to take to get you to Seattle? Because we've got our quarterback who is saying in the national media that we need to improve the offensive line. And quite frankly, we don't want to lose Russell Wilson, so we're going to placate him with a superstar offensive lineman that we didn't bring in last year. So I bring in Brandon Scherf and I'm going into that next game against the LA Rams. And I'm saying, I've got Brandon Scherf to try and help against that absolute monster across the other end of the, of the, of the defensive line yeah. in Aaron Donald. And that and that's what I'm doing. And if it costs $15 million to bring Brandon Scherf to Seattle, then I'm making that investment. And I'm just going with that. And I'm going to say, do you know what? We've, we've brought in an offensive coordinator who we think Russell Wilson will want to work with and can and can bring all of these parties together. Now we're going to bring an offensive line who can do the same thing. Is going to enable us to run the ball, which is what Pete Carroll wants to do. And he's going to enable Russell Wilson to be protected so that he gets time in the pocket to do what he wants to do. And I'm very happy to just spend that money on Brandon Scherf and see how it goes. And if it's not Scherf, you've got Joe Tooney at, at New England who yeah. you could bring in. If you wanted to bring Corey Lindsley in as a center from Green Bay, you know, that's another option there. You've got Alex Mack who's already sort of reaching out to the 49ers and saying that he'd quite like to go and play there. I mean, you've got a few different options on a veteran offensive lineman. That is what I am looking for. I want to I want to get in the top 10 for the offensive line in 2021 
And that is the first move that I'm making. And frankly, if you know, if the people picketing outside the office um, were unhappy with a big investment on the O line, then uh, that that goes against what a lot of Seahawks fans have been saying for the last ten years. Well, I think once you announce the Sheriff move, I think some of that would would peter out. I think some of those people would go home. Um, so so now you've upgraded left guard with an elite talent. Uh, now what do you do at the center position? Do you bring Ethan Posick back, or you look, you look elsewhere? I'm, I'm looking for an upgrade there. and I don't think Ethan Posick played particularly well. I think at the start of the year when Russell was cooking, um, I think he, it was perhaps everything was kind of working well. But as soon as they tried and they, they hit a bit of turmoil and then tried to get it back again, I thought that Ethan Posick's performance was not particularly good. So I'm looking for an upgrade there. I'm testing the veteran market again. I'm, I'm going to see if, if I've got Scherf and I've created a load of money. Because here's the thing. If you trade Wagner and Jamal Adams, you've not just saved money this year. You have created, you know, about forty million dollars of free cap space next year. So what yeah. you could actually do is you could say to Corey Lindsay, "We're going to keep your year one cap it at about three, four million dollars, so that we can bring a load of guys in." But then next year's cap's going to be higher. This happens all the time. Frank Clark's first year cap hit in Kansas City was six million dollars yeah. because the extension was structured that way, and then it gets bigger as you go along, but it enables you to do more in the in the formative years of that contract. So you could easily bring in a sheriff on a five, six million a year cap hit this year, a Corey Lindsay, three or four million. You've only spent $10 million this year and you've got a really expensive, uh, a really experienced defensive line. But failing that, or maybe on top of that, I'm looking in the draft and I'm seeing what's there. Now, this is a really great draft for interior offensive linemen. So whether it's a, a guard or a center, you know, I'm, I'm, Quinn Miners is somebody who was fantastic at the senior yeah. ball. I think he'd be really good to look at him. People have got Alex Leatherwood, who I think can move into guard from left tackle. You've got Aaron Banks at Notre Dame. You've got Ben Cleveland, who I like a lot in, in Georgia. You've got Dante Smith, who is really rising up the boards, could go in the second round now from ECU, who was superb um, at, the, at the senior bowl as well. You've got a whole bunch of really good offensive linemen in this draft class, and I'd like to keep plowing resources into that. You know, O-line, D-line. Set out to have a really good O-line and a really good D-line, and if you've got Russell Wilson... You're going to win a, a whole bunch of football games, not just in the regular season, but in the playoffs. That's when it matters. Only one playoff win in the last four years. They've got to change that. Yeah. It, it's obviously, if you were to do that, hypothetically again, if you if you got Brandon Scherf and, and Corey Lindsley, without a doubt, Russell Wilson, based on his comments the last couple of days, and, and I don't want to retrace those completely. Go to the Seahawks draft blog. Rob did a piece on it. Uh, really capsulize his thoughts on it. But certainly, based on what Russ has been saying, that would make him happy. Would that be enough? Or you think they need to add a little bit more to the offense, too? Certainly, they have to deal with Chris Carson. You could maybe afford to bring him back if you made those moves. Um, but it, it feels like we're always looking for that number three target for him, too, as well. I think it would be a, a mere start. I think Russell is being very, very serious here. And, the, and it's going to be interesting to see how the Seahawks respond. Because... A lot of people, Dan, are just saying this is a storm in a teacup. This is this is nothing. You know, no, it, it doesn't it's not, really. It's not nothing. <laughs> it's, it, it, I'm telling you now, right? If you think the national media have thought, well, Tom Brady's just won his seventh Super Bowl, and you've got all of the storylines revolving around Kansas City, and where are they going to go from here? Because they've got a lot on their plate off the back of that Super Bowl and the events, the unfortunate events leading up to that Super Bowl. As well, you've got where's Carson Wentz going to go? Yeah. You've got where is what you know? What are certain teams going to do at quarterback? Attention now turns to the draft. The national media's got so many top. It doesn't need to create news about Russell Wilson. Russell Wilson is creating the news. He yeah. is going out of his way job. to do it. He's got his sharp elbows out and he's barged his way into the media yeah. agenda ever since the Super Bowl. His 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 people, Mark Rogers, his agent. Um, has been speaking to Jason Lecomfora, who was in Tampa Bay as part of the CBS broadcast crew. A lot of the journalists were not at the Super Bowl because of the coronavirus. Jason was there, and he's spoken to Mark Rogers, and he's reported stuff. You've got Brandon Marshall all of a sudden saying that he thinks Russell Wilson wants out. You've got Russell Wilson coincidentally appearing on the Dan Patrick show right, right. after the Super Bowl for no real obvious reason other than to, to say that he's not happy with the O-line and have Dan Patrick grill him on whether he's going to be traded or not. And then you've got Mike Florio is very connected to um, to Mark Rogers, also talking about it ad nauseum again now. So this is there's a reason why this is going on. And if and Russell Wilson wants an O line, but he also wants what Brady has, which is when Tom Brady says, "Get me Rob Gronkowski," 
and Tampa Bay get him Rob Gronkowski. Get me Antonio Brown, and they get him Antonio Brown. Get me Leonard Fournette, and they get him Leonard Fournette. Mm. Russell Wilson wants to be able, and let's not forget that Wilson won an Antonio Brown and the Seahawks didn't get him. So let's let's just acknowledge what Wilson wants. Also remember he that he wanted him. Greg Olson last year, and we ended up spending $7 million on him. That wasn't the best investment either. But at least, at least what he's asking for this year is something we can all agree on. Well, with with Greg, this is the thing. I think Russell tends to forget the times when uh, maybe the Seahawks have listened to him and only remember the times when they didn't. <laughs> but I guess that when you're a thirty-five million dollar a year quarterback and you're married to Sierra, then maybe that is that you know you tend to f- to only think about the things that that are in your favor. Mm-hmm. Um, I, I look, they're going to have to do more. They're going to have yeah. to. I think at the top of the O line, they're going to have to get him either a really great tight end who can. And, and then use the tight end, which is the what they didn't do in 2020, or a, a third receiver who can who can be really really useful. Because Brady had weapons, Mahomes had weapons, Russell Wilson's got a couple of weapons, not much else. Which brings me to to the hire of Shane Waldron, and I feel like 2021 in so many ways is so pivotal um, because now some of the reporting we've heard over the last 20 24 hours there was some there was speculation last week but now there's some hard reporting behind it that he in fact I think he even talked about it yesterday in one of the conference calls that he was he was very involved in the hiring process of that and he went so far yesterday as to indicate that he didn't like some of the names early in the process we didn't like him either and that when it made that shift about halfway through the process when we started hearing names like Ken Dorsey Mike Kafka and then ultimately Shane Waldron it was because of his influence to me He's he's painted himself into a corner to some respects. If the Shane Waldron thing doesn't work, then we could because I don't think he's going to get traded this offseason. But we'll legitimately it'll be the number one storyline going into twenty twenty two. Don't you think? There are so many strands to this. So with the with the Shane Waldron thing, it may even be that Wilson made it very clear that he wasn't keen on some of those other names, and then when he kind of got his own way, he might be feeling you know a very strong position right now to Mm -hmm. say. You know, I, I kind of uh, flexed a little bit on the coordinates and now I'm going to do it on the offensive line. And by the way, my agent's going to speculate that maybe I want to be traded. And he's he's now sort of seeing what he can, how far can I push the boundaries here? What can I get away with? What is the team willing to do for me? Now, I thought the Seahawks did a good job in, in that offensive coordinates, coordinator search in finding somebody who could maybe, I thought when they made that appointment, that it was going to, like you said, it was going to just push everything to at least next year. Um, and if it didn't work out, we'd be having these conversations in a year's time. Yeah. But it seems to me that Wilson is, he's not feeling that way, that he's sort of saying, this is just the start. The coordinator was not the be all and end all. That was the start. You know, now it's about what happens next. And I don't think Russell Wilson speaking today on the 10th of Feb is going to get traded, but I, it could, it could change that way. If he doesn't get his own way, if he doesn't get reassurances in the way that he's hoping for, he does not want to waste a year of his career and his life. He is 33 in December. Next season, he'll be 34. Now, that's when you start thinking, that's a quarterback getting up in age. Yeah. I, and I speak as a 36-year-old, so I'm not doing any bit. So, <laughs> 30, so when he's, he's starting to get up in, in age a little bit there. And... And also, here's the other thing you've got to remember, is that I think opportunity, he sees potential in terms of the Saints are going to move on from Drew Brees. I don't know how on earth they will do the trade. It doesn't. I don't think Wilson's tough. thinking about that. Yeah. However, I suspect that Wilson quite fancies the idea of playing for Sean Payton in New Orleans and following oh, in sure. the footsteps of his hero. Yeah. And in 12 months' time, New Orleans might not be in the market for a quarterback, but they are now, potentially. And I wonder a little bit whether he's sort of got one eye on, is there an opportunity there? Do I want to try and see if I can make that happen? And on the other hand, he's got one eye on, can I push the Seahawks to my way of thinking? But whether it's that way or that way, I'm getting what I want. And I kind of feel that's where he is at at the moment. Well, it's interesting because I think the the Brandon Marshall comments yesterday um, – we're about half hogwash, and then uh, and then some of it. Obviously, he's very connected, and I thought some of it was dead on. I, I thought the point that he made that was really crystal clear uh, that I agreed with was Russell's so concerned with his public perception that 
if it if it does reach a point, let's say they go into free agency in the draft and they just do what they've been doing for years and they try to get a couple of low end bargain basement free agents in the third wave. Um, they end up taking a, a running back with their first pick and they don't really address offensive line in any meaningful way. Um, at that point, if he gets angry enough, upset enough that he wants to try and force something, and again, the money makes it very difficult, for him to be able to massage that and manipulate that in a way that makes him look good, that, that's going to be tough to juggle for him. It really is. I think the one thing on the money, because people, you know, a lot of people will say, well, he can't be traded because of the... Listen, if you want to be, tra- if you're Russell Wilson and you want to be traded, then you you say to the Silks, I want to go and do you know what? I'm going to rework my contract so that you can make this happen. Hmm. Because there's no, you can't force the Seahawks to take on $39 million. $39 million, yeah. You, you can't, you, you know, it's just not realistic. If he, wants to yeah. tra- if he wants to be traded, he turns to them and says, right, okay, whatever. Right off the, I, tra- I back myself. Right off the guarantees, I'll go and sign a new contract in um, in New Orleans or wherever, and I'll I'll back myself if, if, if I have to take a hit on that or whatever. If, if he wants to go, it's up to him to make it happen. It's not up to the Seahawks to take on $40 million for him to play for somebody else in, in 2021. So that's, that's sort of the first thing um, on that. He's I, the, the a part of me as a mere sort of observer of the Seahawks and someone who wants them to succeed, Dan, makes me actually quite encouraged that Wilson is doing this because the thought of just meandering through this offseason a bit like they did last year, picking up a $2 million player here and a $3 million player here, having like, found some you know way of using the credit card to get a bit of extra cash so they can fill the holes and, yeah. and get a bunch of... you know backup players to come and fill out the roster and then sort of going into next year with pretty much the same roster, but maybe a little bit weaker than this year with a tougher schedule just fills me with with complete dissatisfaction. So the fact that Wilson's coming out and going, no, that's not good enough for me. You're going to have to do this, 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 and this makes me think, well, now the pressure's on. What are the Seahawks going to do and how are they going to do it? And it means, you know, from writing an article about what I would do, in order to, in, and, and thinking there's not much chance of a lot of this happening, but this is, I'm just going to put out what I would do mm-hmm. and people can read it and have their own views on that and, and maybe give their own suggestions. I'm now actually thinking, well, what other choice have the Seahawks got but to do something aggressive and bold and be honest in order to, to placate Wilson? Because otherwise, he, he may well turn around pretty soon and just go, I'm, I'm done. You're going to have to move me. I'm, I'm going to pull a Deshaun Watson. Yeah. And I'm I'm going to go somewhere else. And that's the other thing to remember here. We're living in a, in a very strange time where big name quarterbacks are not just being moved, as we've seen with Stafford and Goff, but they're demanding to be moved, like Deshaun Watson. So yeah. it's a unique situation. Yeah, it's uh, it's the whole thing is fascinating, and and I 100 percent agree with you on on a couple of things you touched on there. One was. I, I'm at first, uh, it made me a little nervous, you know, that he was coming out this way just because it, it really does kind of create a slippery slope and it, and it makes it you know, just another thing on the Seahawks plate to try and manage this off season. But man, I, if it works, if, if it in any way influences the Seahawks to address an area of the roster that we've all been saying for years, hasn't been addressed appropriately, then it's a win-win for everybody. The other thing that you said that I, I thought was, was dead on is they really do have to do something because the alternative, the alternative to your plan is with no cap space and only four draft picks trying to upgrade the roster and make yourself a contender. And that just can't happen. Yeah. And, and look, people say, well, you can restructure and you can extend. That's not their all- way, though. They just haven't really they might do it here and there, but they haven't really gone down that road like some other organizations. We've seen New Orleans, Dallas uh, come to mind. This just hasn't been their way. And they're two great examples. Do you want to end up like them? Because yeah. uh, look, New Orleans Saints were $100 million over the cap until Drew, uh, Drew Brees basically wrote off a load of uh, money so that they could be only $75 million over the cap instead. And this is the thing. So people say, well, extend Carlos on that. Well, how much, how, how, for how many years? He's 32. Yeah. So if you extend him for one more year, how much are you lowering his cap hit from $14 million? If you're saying, well, okay, we'll give you like two years, uh, $20 million guaranteed, well, then you're lowering it by... Four million dollars. That's it. You know, it's not a great deal of money. That suddenly you've got six million to spend. It's not a huge amount. Okay, you extend Tyler Lockett. People say extend Tyler Lockett, lower his cap hit. Well, uh, Tyler Lockett's cap hit right now is eleven million dollars, and Robert Woods and Cooper Cup have just signed deals for sixteen million dollars, which is five million dollars a year more. So if you extend Tyler Lockett, that's the kind of money you're talking about. How are you going to give him a pay rise of five million dollars and lower his cap hit this year? Yeah. Unless you're prepared to pay him. 
22 million dollars in 2022 i mean that's just ridiculous or when he's like 32 are you going to be paying him 25 million dollars for a season yeah and that's right when you'll have to pay dk too so it's just yeah it's one thing after another it's not realistic to sort of just push this down the road and like look they can transfer a bit of russell wilson's contract so they could extend you can pick away at these things but the absolute best you can do is create just enough to do a few things to fill a few holes and that is not going to cut. It's clear. Russell Wilson is saying that is not acceptable. The the Benson Mayoa deals and the uh, BJ Finney deals and the Mike Yapati deals yeah. are not going to cut it this year. You've got to get an O line. You've got to get me some weapons. How are you going to do it? The, you know, he's thrown down the gauntlet to them. And when we talk about only two million dollars in effective cap space, we're talking about. And, and I, I don't think some people quite understand this. We're talking about that doesn't include people who are now free agents as, as soon as the league year starts. So that's no Chris Carson. That's no Shaq Griffin. That's no Ethan Posick. That's no Mike Upati. That's all these holes that you mentioned earlier, starting from scratch, having to make up for that without that cap space. We haven't really talked about the running back position. Um, Chris Carson's a free agent. You mentioned in your piece that there's, there's a chance with – with uh, COVID and the effects it's had on the salary caps, um, that maybe the market won't be there like he wants it to. He takes a one-year deal to come back at a low number. That aside, just the idea of what he's brought the Seahawks, what they're looking for, his durability issues, is Chris Carson someone that you're trying to bring back? I think you've got to be really careful with that because they they had to mother him through this season. And Carson has had a real mix of things like in some seasons like 2017 when he missed pretty much the whole year in college he had injuries then you've you know he's he's had other years where he's kind of been banged up throughout the season but played you've got like 2019 where he got a serious hip injury at the end of the season so he didn't wasn't there for the playoffs when he played most of the year but then was out and um i just you know the seahawks with the way that pete cow wants to play they need that guy who you're going to rock up on a sunday and they're going to take 20 carries, and they're going to be 20 effective carries. And he doesn't have that at the moment. And it's it's really tough. It's really, really tough to watch the Cleveland Browns and watch yeah. they, they run the ball. You know, they've got their – and it's it, and this is the thing, Dan, that I've never understood about the Seahawks, is that they come out and they've, they're so clear on what they want their identity to be. This is the kind of team that we want to be. And yet they don't do any of the moves that enable them to be that kind of team. So Cleveland – Let's say that Cle- I don't listen to the Cleveland press conferences. Let's say that they want to be, they say same very similar things to Pete Cowell. They go and draft a first round left tackle. They go and spend big money on keeping Joel Batonio. They go and spend money in free agency to get JC Tretter. They then go and um, spend big money on Jack Conklin. Yeah. They find and develop a really good offensive lineman in, in, in draft a free agency. I think it was a late round pick in Teller. They then go and get Nick Chubb, who was the prototype for what Pete Cowell wants in his offense. And for some reason, they overthought that and decided that Rashad <laughs> Penny, Penny won instead. Won. And his one year at San Diego State was better than Nick Chubb's, you know, countless seasons at Georgia and all yeah. the production that he had there and all the exposure or letters he had. Um, they don't they don't invest in their O line. They invest in linebacker and safety instead. And, and you know, when you watch them run and you, they've got Kareem Hunt and Nick Chubb, you're thinking, don't you want that? You yeah. know, where where uh, where are you? I wanted Alex Van Pelt to be a candidate for the OC job. I mean, why have you not yeah. gone and, and gone for that kind of? team identity and that approach and they did in 2010 you know the first thing they did was sign and draft offensive linemen and, and go and have to go and sign Marshawn Lynch and yeah. for some reason I'm completely against that and you know I think with they need to go and get a running back they need to go and get two running backs now and I'm not saying that you have to go and throw money at it I'm just saying you need to go and find two who can be as reliable as a, a certain Mr. Chubb and a Mr. Hunt in uh, Cleveland and you need to go and put an offensive lineman in front of them that will yeah. move people out of the way. Well, in your scenario, you've uh, you've recouped some draft picks and you've fortified the offensive line, so you've you've really established a great environment to drop a running back into. Um, give me a couple of names from the draft that would make sense for them to target early on. Oh, Javante Williams would be a fantastic pick. You yeah. know, he's, he's such a tough physical runner. His yards after contact is unbelievable. If you just there's a 12 minute YouTube highlights video um, that if you just go and type in Javante Williams' name, it pops up straight away. And uh, if that hasn't got a million hits by the end of the uh, the draft season, I'll be stunned because it's just such a fun player to watch. I mean, he, he, his physicality and his toughness and the way he breaks tackles has to be seen to be believed. 
And um, I think he would be a fantastic pick for the Seahawks and, and the way that they want to run. There aren't a whole host of alternatives, to be perfectly honest, in this draft class who really fit the Seahawks. I mean, there's one or two that I quite like. Khalil Herbert is a player so sharp, so quick, but I think he's more of a fit for the Niners offense than the Seahawks offense. You've got, you've got your people like Najee Harris at the top of the, of the draft and, and Travis Etienne, who are going to sure. go quite early as well. But Javante Williams really is the name that stands out to me. If they could acquire him, then you've got a shot at repairing your running game. Is there still a chance that Rashad Penny could be the guy? I don't think he can be the guy. I think he could be the number two. Okay. Um, but you've, you've got to a point now where he hasn't played for, well, he's not going to play for nearly two years by the no. time we get to next season. And how much can you really trust and depend on him? I mean, he's just... It, it, it's it's been a poor pick. I mean, it, it, we can just say that now. He's he's shown the occasional flash, hasn't he? Like Pittsburgh a year ago in the second game of the season, he suddenly breaks off a 50-yard run, and, and that's what he was. You know, he, he, every now and again, it was just, there's nothing happening, nothing happening. Big run from Rashad Penny. That's that's kind of what he is. But in terms of somebody who can carry the load of this this offense, I've, I'm just not sure what they they were thinking yeah. when they drafted it. People have said, oh, it's because they wanted a compliment to Chris Carson. When they drafted Richard Petty, Chris Carson had officially played four games for the Seahawks, broke his leg, and then didn't play anymore. He was in his second season with the team or going into his second season with the team, recovering off a broken leg or broken ankle when they drafted Richard Penny. So they clearly thought that Penny could be the guy. I have absolutely no idea why they thought he could be the guy over someone like Nick Chubb. Yeah, it's the only thing I could think of is, and you mentioned it, they were coming off, you know, Carson had the promising rookie year and then broke his leg. It's, you know, Carroll went out of his way in the post-draft press conference to talk about the durability score that they gave uh, to Penny in college. And we all know Chubb had the ACL he battled. I wonder if it just came down to that. Because at the time, I tried to justify the pick. I I drank the Kool-Aid. Oh, yeah, they, there was a drop-off. They weren't picking for a while. The running backs in that range were going to be gone. That's the guy they liked. I liked his tape from the senior year there. It's just, uh, you know, we always say on draft day, wait three years and then we'll judge it. It, it certainly seems like the jury is in uh, on awesome. Penny. Someone sent me an article, Dan, saying, well, you said, you, you, you know, there was nothing wrong with the penny pick when it when it happened. And what I actually wrote was um, the, the the thought process, you know, the drafting of a running back, really, is a, you know, because they wanted to fix their running game. And it was a great running back draft. And that's where the value was at that point. Yeah. But it was nothing about they should have taken Penny ahead of Nick Chubb. And on the durability thing, people should remember, Penny had one year in, mm-hmm. in, in a conference in college football where the year before Donnell Pumphrey weighs about 160 pounds yeah. set the NCAA record for rushing so yeah. this was an offense that was set up to run very very well and he had one year of production as the starter Nick Chubb played for three full seasons it would have been four but for the injury and he played two seasons after his serious injury and was absolutely fine was leading them to the national championship at the end the Seahawks overthought it and Lance Zealand's already said this on Twitter that they regret that massively We've got a couple of minutes left with Rob Staten of the Seahawk Draft Blog. Again, I really appreciate you joining me. Uh, this has been great. I want people that aren't familiar with you or haven't read or heard your stuff yet. What's your background? Clearly, you're not from the Northwest. Just by listening, we can tell that. What is your background and how did you become such a Seahawk fan? So I used to live in Vancouver and uh, I, I went over there and um, one day we, so me and my, she was my girlfriend at the time, we're now married. Um, we decided we were going to go to Seattle and we went to Seattle and, uh, we went to watch a Mariners game. The Mariners lost 10 zero to the, to the, uh, Toronto Blue Jays. And, um, I can't, I can't say it was a great experience. And then we left outside and walked past as it was known at the time, Quest Field. Yeah. Uh, uh, you know, I turned to my wife and said, I'd love to get, love to go and see a you know, football game there. Uh, when the season starts. Now, we knew that we were probably going to be heading back to England later in the year, so we were kind of running out of time to do it. Uh, we were going to go to Hawaii on a holiday instead because that's I'd practically just worked six days a week, 14-hour days for like 11 months, and we needed a break. And um, I managed to twist her arm and go back to Seattle to watch uh, Monday Night Football between Seattle and Green Bay in 2006. Oh, was that the snow uh, game? Okay. So we, we yeah. went to the snow game. Yeah. Um, and that was tough getting as- out of there after that. <laughs> I remember the walk home was uh, was particularly frozen, like walking back. But yeah. I remember walking into the stadium and just sort of looking around and feeling the atmosphere and seeing that flag go up and just thinking at the time, this is for me, you know, this is great, nice. you know. And, and just and instantly, like, I was cheering for the team. I'd never, I never had any connection to the Seahawks and I was cheering for them there. This guy randomly came and gave me a fist bump at the end when they'd won. And I just thought, this is great. And then the, the following weekend, I was watching them against the Broncos on the TV um then we went back to England I haven't missed a game since that Packers game I've stayed up and watched every single game whether it's on at 
one o'clock in the morning or 6 p.m. over here. Um, I've been hooked for, uh, what, 15 years now. So um, uh, that's that's the story, and I try and get over to Seattle whenever I can. That's a great one. You picked a great game to have as your first game at uh, then Quest Field. I remember that game well. They were down big at halftime. Uh, came back to win. The snow just kept building throughout the game. And uh, it was the first time, born and raised here myself, first time I'd ever seen cars abandoned on the freeway because people couldn't drive in it. I lived 10 miles away from the stadium at the time, and it took five hours to get home. Um, but they won, so it was worth it. So it was... Uh, it really was the thing, funny thing about that game is I had a ticket that said um, Row SR on the ticket, and I had no idea. We couldn't find Row SR. We were yeah. up and down the... St- Where's Row SR? Standing room, the, right? And then they said, it's oh, it's standing room yeah. only. So we had to go stand on this number, and I'd never done that before in any game. They don't have that in England. And my <laughs> miss, not a big NFL fan in the slightest, was like, are you kidding me? It's like minus eight. Degree. In our temperature, it's like minus eight. And um, and it's snowing, and I've got one coat on, and uh, I've got a great picture of her wearing my coat in the stadium, freezing to death. Nice. Uh, not looking very happy, but I'm like, yeah, <laughs> what an experience. So um, I love that game. Well, listen, it was really great to have you on. I appreciate it. I'll have to get you back on before the draft, get your uh, thoughts on some specific prospects that you think will be targeted by the Seahawks, and maybe by then we'll even have a couple more picks in the coffers. So uh, Rob Staten, Seahawks draft blog, definitely check it out. Thanks for joining me, my friend. Anytime, Dan. Thank you. All right. That was Rob Staten of the Seahawks draft blog. Uh, if you're a Seahawk fan and you like really well-written stuff and really in-depth analysis, SeahawksDraftBlog.com. Check it out. Read his latest piece on his uh, deeper thoughts on Russell Wilson, what it might mean for his future in Seattle and how all of that fits in. That is going to wrap it up uh, for this week. Um, shout out to Jordan Van Beek. Check out his uh, Twitch stream at twitch.tv slash geekbeak. Thanks to Eric Briggs and Jordan for their contributions to the show. Thanks to Kevin Jablonski for his contributions as well. Next week is all about the Mariners. They open spring training next Wednesday. I'll be joined by Ty Gonzalez and Colby Patnode of True to the Trident. We'll do a spring training preview with those two guys. Listen to the 365 Sportscast Network on your Android or iPhone app or at 365sportscast.com. And if you missed part of this episode or want to replay it, subscribe to the Emerald City Sportscast podcast on all major platforms. The Emerald City Sportscast YouTube channel also has all the video streams saved for you. And you can also watch it live on video there. Um, Please like and subscribe to the channel if you do. That really helps the visibility of the show. That is it for me. Again, my thanks to Rob Staten. I am Dan Viennes. This is the Emerald City Sportscast. You've been listening to the 365 Sportscast Network. Until next week, go Seahawks, go Mariners, go Coop. Thanks, you guys.